Today I want us to speak about hindrances to acceptable worship because God does expect us to worship Him and that worship must be done in an acceptable way. If it's not acceptable to God, it's not really worth all that much. Jesus taught us <clears throat> that we are to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In John, the fourth chapter, verse 23 and 24, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. <clears throat> this is one of the foremost passages dealing with worship. Sets forth those three principles that we are to worship the Father, that that worship must be done in spirit, and it must be done in truth. But that is for the true worshiper. There are certain things, though, that can hinder our worship to God and thus make it where it will not be an acceptable worship and thus I want us to look at things that hinder that acceptable worship and the very first thing that we want to discuss is the aspect that it not being in spirit we are to worship and this deals with the proper attitude of mind we are to worship in spirit. Uh, that's what the idea of in spirit in John 4, 23 and 24 has reference to, that we are to worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, spirit dealing with our attitude in that worship. In Matthew, the 15th chapter, <clears throat> as the chief priests and scribes come to Jesus and they're trying to attack Jesus through the apostles. Why don't your disciples obey the tradition of the elders? Why do they transgress that tradition? Because they don't wash their hands before they eat. And so he turns around, why have you transgressed the traditions of God by your traditions? But when we come down to verse 8, he shows an attitude of mind, an attitude of heart of these individuals when he says, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Their attitude is far from God, even though they are claiming a worship to God. They're claiming that we love God so much, we are going to do what God says. And they make all of these claims, but in reality, their hearts far different from that. They don't have the proper attitude of heart in relationship to God, and thus in relationship to worship, and thus the honoring of God with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And so he's dealing with that proper attitude, even in the relationship to the Pharisees that come to him on this occasion. Our worship must be in spirit. It must be with the proper attitude. And so that really starts the question, where is our mind centered when we're worshiping God? Now, is it really centered upon God? Or is it centered upon other things? You know, in reality, it's easy to allow our minds to wonder. It's easy to get into an attitude of something far different than worshiping God. A lot of times we come as a spectator. We're to be entertained. The preacher, the song leader, those who lead in prayer... They have to do a sufficient job for us to be entertained or else we're not going to come back. A lot of times that's why you get basically professional entertainers coming in and performing for those who are supposed to be worshiping. They are there, though, not as worshipers. They're there as spectators. A lot of times, and I think 
preachers oftentimes get into this. We talk about here we are and you being the audience. Uh, no, that's wrong. In reality, you're not the audience, not a one of you. If anyone, God would be the audience of our worship. Your worship, my worship, that's the aspect that we need to have. We are worshiping God. God's the audience, not you, not me. But a lot of times we get into that spectator-type mode instead of an attitude of, I'm going to worship God. Or a lot of times, it's a critic mode. I'm going to critique everything that's said. Uh, I'm going to, and some individuals uh, love to catch a preacher, especially uh, saying the wrong things or getting a number out of uh, order or using improper grammar, you know, saying words that really don't exist a lot of times, uh, and they sit as a critic instead of a worshiper. How many times do we do that in relationship to our singing? Well, the song leader pitched it too high, or he pitched it too low, or he got it too fast, or he got it too slow, or he sang it too soft, or he sang it too loud. You know, we can all, and I, I would expect that in relationship to a congregation, you're not going to be able to please everyone in either the preaching or the singing. Some people are going to get upset, either too high, too low, whatever it might be. Are we there as a critic or are we there as a worshiper? None of those things. You know, if... Um, I know Paul, some think that at times he sings too loud. Well, you know the answer to that? Everyone else sings so loud you can't hear him. That settles it, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> now, Paul was very agreeable to that point. <laughs> but wouldn't that settle it? Yeah. Are we here as worshiper or as a critic? What's our attitude of mind in coming to worship God? It's supposed to be that of worshiping God and not being a critic of the worship. Or do we allow our minds to wander to this or that? That's so easy. We have our minds so filled up with other things that when we come to worship, it's easy to allow our minds to start thinking about this or that what I've got to do, you know, to uh, the rest of the day or the rest of the week or what uh, someone else did or this that I've got to correct, I've got to get this done or, you know, sports or food that we've got to fix or this or that. And we just slowly allow our minds to wander away from worshiping God. That becomes a problem where we are not worshiping in spirit. Our worship then is not acceptable to God. Why? Because we must worship in spirit with the proper attitude of mind. So when we sing the songs that we sing, are we making those songs come from us? They are our thoughts that are going up to God in worship to Him and in praising Him. And let me say also in relationship to the, a practice that we see among brethren today that's becoming more and more, uh, well, seen among our brethren. It was seen for a long time in the denominational world. But the idea of having praise teams, we call it a praise team instead of a choir or a chorus, or this idea of where we will give certain individuals a microphone to help, of course, the congregation sing. Of course, then you've got a bunch of leaders, don't you? 
I wonder if they're going to give a microphone to someone who sings in spirit but can't carry a tune in a bucket. Oh no, we won't give it to that person. Why? Because the sound of our ears becomes more important than the sound of our hearts coming up in worship to God. We have become so centered upon the externals instead of the internals, and that's the, what is promoting that type of the thought. We've got to make it sound good, whether it's from the heart or not, makes a little difference in that situation. Where's our heart? Where's our mind? That one who sings and can't carry a tune in the bucket, but he sings in spirit, is singing in an acceptable way to God. We need to quit worrying sometimes, and I'm probably one of the worst to say this, but I quit worrying so much about the tune or the melody and think about the words. When we sing, do we sing about, think about those words being our words, going up in praise to God? When that one leads us in prayer to God, are we thinking about those words that are being said? Are his thoughts becoming our thoughts? His prayer that he is leading us in becoming our prayer? And that's the idea, really, in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 16, so that we can say amen at the giving of thanks. What is it? That prayer that has been led in our presence, we have made ours so that we can say amen. We're saying, let it be so. I am in agreement with this. That's praying in spirit. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, do our minds go back to the death of Christ, the, His body, the blood that He shed upon Calvary's tree? Where is our mind centered as we partake of the Lord's Supper? As we give of our means, are we doing it with the proper attitude? Are we stingy, grumbling, complaining? As we study God's Word in the preaching aspect, uh, probably the preaching is one of the most aspects in that performer audience type of a situation. But it should not be. As I am, it should be I'm leading, or whoever is preaching is leading the thoughts of each one of us. And when we talk about a scripture, we study that scripture. We make the proper application of that scripture. We're studying God's word together. That's the aspect. Where is our mind in relationship to our worship? If it's not on those things that we are doing, then we cannot be worshiping God with the proper attitude or in spirit as God has instructed, and thus our worship is not going to be acceptable to God. But then a second point. And for some reason, Andrew, that's, this has stopped. <laughs> not according to truth. Our worship must likewise be according to truth. And Andrew, maybe if you unplug that and plug it back in, it will get uh, connected again. Our worship is to be according to truth, and certainly John 4, 23 and 24 emphasizes that aspect. Not only are we to be true worshipers, but... And that true worship indicates those three aspects, worshiping the Father, must be done in spirit and in truth. Truth is that which is revealed in God's Word. John 17, verse 17, Jesus in that high priestly prayer says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy Word is truth. 
Now, and if we are to worship God in truth, and then that's in John 4, 24 in particular, and then later on John defines that truth as being the Word of God, we then have an understanding that when we worship God, it must be according to God's Word. We are to worship according to the Word of God. You can go to the next slide, Andrew. In Matthew, the 15th chapter, in verse 9, Again, right after he talks about the attitude of heart of these individuals, he then says, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, they should have been teaching for doctrines the commandments of God, but they changed from God's word to their traditions. Now, Sometimes we rail against traditions. Traditions can be good or bad. Traditions can be the traditions of God or the traditions of men. If they're the traditions of God, then they are bound upon us. If it's the tradition of man, then those traditions of man can be good, they can be bad. If they transgress God's word, as Jesus had shown here in Matthew, the 15th chapter, then they obviously are bad. If we try to bind those traditions upon others, we do wrong. But if it just simply, that which, and tradition very simply means that which has been handed down, if that which has been handed down is expedient, and the true meaning of that, and the advantageous, then it can be a good tradition, and one that is profitable for us. But here, they had substituted for God's Word the traditions of men. And thus, Jesus said, because of that substitution, because you're no longer worshiping God according to, or because you've substituted for God's word the commandments of men, your worship thus is vain. It has no value. Now that's what that type of an attitude does in relationship to, God, to our worship. It makes that worship of no value when we substitute God's, for God's word the words of man or the commandments of men. And so we have to, in our worship, remain faithful to God. Because partial error is still error. Think of a counterfeit bill. And I'll use the illustration of the one that Karen got a couple of years ago. I've been more than that now, but a $20 bill. And guess what? It was counterfeit. It wasn't worth anything. But it looked, on first glance, like it was real. But because it was counterfeit, it was worthless. It was valueless. It was just a little bit of error here and there. And as I say, you glance at it, it's going to look like a true, like it's accurate. But those little mistakes here and there made of where it's counterfeit and it's worthless. Not even worth the paper that it's printed on. Counterfeit bills are worthless. When we get a little bit of error in relationship to the Word of God, then it makes our worship worthless. It makes it vain. It's said that rat poison contains 98% good ingredients. Ingredients are good. Hell, it won't cause any damage. But there's 2% of the ingredients that kills the rats. It emphasizes, again, the aspect a little bit of poison will still kill. 
even though the majority of the ingredients are good and healthy, and we would like, you start getting a little bit of poison, and it kills someone, or it kills the rat in this case. Rat poison, 98% good ingredients, but only 2%, and it kills the poison, and it kills the rat. Partial error is still error. Now then, what we then have to do is we have to go to God's Word, and we have to see what God's Word authorizes us in worship to God. And when we start studying that, we find that God's Word authorizes five avenues through which we worship Him. And let me say, I worded it in that way for a specific reason. Because those items, five avenues, they are not worship themselves. We worship God through those items. But our worship is to God by using those items that God has authorized. Well, what has God authorized? Well, first, we are to sing. In Ephesians 5 and verse 19, Paul would write, Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The word singing here comes from a Greek word. It's the Greek word lelontos from leleo. And it's dealing with the utterance of the words. It is not dealing so much with the substance of the words. That would be the Greek term lego that would deal with the substance. Leleo deals with the utterance of the words. And so he says you are to utter words in speaking in this singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It is a singing. And when you look at the word singing, you start seeing an aspect that God has expected us to do. It authorizes singing. Singing does not authorize other aspects. And here's a word that was used, a couple of words that were used in our lectureship, coordinates and subordinates. We need to understand that. Coordinate, other things of equal nature. Subordinate, things that would be subordinate to that, that one thing. God authorizes singing. He does not authorize other coordinates. Everything that is subordinate to singing would certainly be authorized. For part harmony, for example, is a subordinate of singing. However, humming, that's not, that is a coordinate of singing and it would not be authorized. Whistling, use of, in, of uh, instrumental music, and so forth. Those things are not authorized by the word singing. Singing authorizes that action, singing. It doesn't authorize all of these other things. In Colossians 3 and verse 16, we again start saying this aspect, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in, in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Again, there's that authorization of singing. That doesn't authorize these other actions. You can search the New Testament over. You will not find the authorization for humming, for whistling, for making your voices sound like an instrument, or for instrumental music. Those things are coordinates with singing, and they are not authorized by God. God authorizes that action of singing. In that singing, it is the speaking of words. Thus, speaking to yourselves in Ephesians 
when we get down to Colossians 3.16, it deals with the contents of those words because those words are to be teaching and admonishing one another. And thus, again, it is the speaking of words in that singing. Mechanical instruments of music don't do that. Whistling, humming, or making our voices sound like instruments and all of that does not teach and admonish. It doesn't deal with the substance that is to be spoken of in our singing of words. But the singing is the making of melody in your heart. That's the aspect of that what we talked about in relationship to our attitude, our hearts. The word in Colossians 3.16 uh, singing with grace in your hearts is parallel to that making music in, or making melody in your hearts. It is coming from the heart. It has to have the proper attitude. But the action has to be correct as well. What's the action? Singing. The singing of words that teach and admonish. That's the action that God has set forth that has, he has authorized in worship to him. And so, the bringing in of mechanical instruments of music and things like unto that, there's no authority for it. Those, that is excluded because God never included it. And thus, to use such is to make our worship Vain, because it is no longer according to God's word, it then becomes according to man's word and man's ideas. Then there is the partaking of the Lord's Supper. In Acts 20 and verse 40, or Acts 2 and verse uh, 42, it says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Well, here's the breaking of bread deals specifically with the Lord's Supper. The breaking of the bread, talking about the partaking of the unleavened bread, the, along with the fruit of the vine, but he uses one to, to express the idea of both that would be contained within the Lord's Supper. In Acts the 20th chapter and verse 7, upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread... Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. They came together. What day? Well, here we find the authorization of the day in which we do this. It's the first day of the week. They came together for this express purpose of partaking of the Lord's Supper, the unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. We know that it's unleavened bread because of when Jesus instituted it, all leaven had to be gone from the house. Leaven could not be used during that time. And thus, they used unle Jesus used unleavened bread in the institution, instituting of the Lord's Supper. And then he said the fruit of the vine. And so we use those two elements and to change and to alter those as some have in the past. Some, some have added things such as Coke, They've added peanut butter and other items and thought that it was so spiritual. Well, no, it was a transgression of God's word and made their worth, worship worthless. Even within the church now, though, we're saying, well, we didn't partake of the Lord's Supper on Thursday night. Why? Because that's the night Jesus supposedly instituted it, which that's uh, subject to debate as well, but... No, the only day that is authorized is the first day of the week. Others say Saturday is all right, or any day of the week. Several years ago when I went to Lubbock, I stayed with someone in their home and for the lectureship there, and that Saturday night they went to a wedding and they served the Lord's Supper at that wedding, and this was in, at the... Uh, Church of Christ there in Lubbock. 
No, the only day that God has authorized is that first day of the week. Now then, denominational world comes along and says, well, uh, you know, we can partake of it once a year or on a quarterly basis or a monthly basis, and they change the time. You know, when God said to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, in Exodus 20th chapter, he didn't have to say, remember every Sabbath day although he did, but he didn't have to specify it. Why? Because it's understood. Sabbath came, day came every seventh day. So the first day of the week comes every week. It's really almost ridiculous that we have to stress something like that, and yet we do. But this is the day in which the Lord has authorized us to partake of that bread unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. But then prayer is also a part of that. Again, in Acts 2 and verse 20, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. They're the prayers. And in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 15, what is it then? I will sing with, I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. 1 Corinthians 14 is dealing with a public nature of worship. And he's saying in that prayer, I'm going to pray with the Spirit and pray with the understanding. Praying, and he uses the same thing in relationship to singing, both of those with the Spirit there, deals with the attitude that we have. The understanding deals with giving understanding to others. We pray in such a way that we give understanding to everyone else so we, everyone can say amen at the giving of thanks. And that's verse 16. Because what? They understand what was being prayed, what was being sung, but in that prayer, they can say then, Amen. This prayer is mine. The one who has led in prayer has led in such a way that the prayer can become everyone's and everyone's thus petition going up to God. And thus worshiping or praying in spirit. But the prayer, as we study prayer throughout the scriptures, that prayer is to be done prayed to the Father through the mediatorship of Christ. We don't have the right, we don't have the authority to pray to other individuals. Whether it be Jesus, the Holy Spirit, Mary, or an apostle, or a dead uh, relative, or anyone else. Our prayers are to be directed to the Father through Jesus, our one and mediator between God and man. The contribution 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Some say, oh, well, this de isn't dealing with what we do today. That this was a special occasion in which Paul was taking up money or a collection that he was going to take to the poor saints at Jerusalem. That was the occasion of this writing, yes. But, does the first day of the weekend uh, when he took that money to the poor saints in Jerusalem? Well, no. Why should we think that the collection would uh, was be done upon the first day of the week? They were doing that, taking up that collection so the money would be there in the church treasury to meet that need that, would, that had arisen. So when Paul comes through, the money would be there. And thus, do the needs of the church, have they ended at that point in time? Well, obviously not. We, the church still has needs that arise. And so this command that he gave to the churches of Galatia, that he's giving to the church at Corinth, and what he commanded the church at Corinth four times in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, what I've commanded you, I've commanded everyone, everyone, everywhere. So it 
also has commanded us that upon the first day of the week, we put money into that collection plate, that treasury of the church. In St. Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verse 6 and verse 7, he expresses to a great extent the attitude that we are to have that, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he hath purchased, purposed in his heart, so let him give, not, of, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. And thus we see the attitude of our giving. We also see that it is to be a bountiful giving, not grudgingly, or of necessity, and it is not to be sparingly, but we go back, and when we go back to 1 Corinthians 16, we see that it is to be as God has prospered us. So we consider what God has given unto us, and based upon that, we then give of our means into that common treasury. And then there is to be the preaching. In Acts 2 and verse 42 again, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That is the teaching that the apostles were giving. And thus in Acts 20 and verse 7, when they came together, Paul preached unto them. There is that preaching aspect in which there is a study, a learning of that doctrine a learning of that which is being taught so that we can apply those things to our lives and we can live in an acceptable way and we can worship acceptably to God. And when we transgress those ways, then we no longer worship acceptably. When we don't have that proper attitude of mind and heart, we don't worship God acceptably. Those things hinder our acceptable worship. Well, Lord willing, this afternoon we'll look at some other aspects of things which hinder acceptable worship. But these are important. All of them are. Because God expects us to be a worshiping people. And when we do not worship acceptably to God then we're not going to be saved. We're not going to be pleasing God, and we're not going to live and be that type of individual and that type of person that God expects us to be. So if you're not here this morning and you're not a Christian, then you can become such by obedience to the will of God. If you haven't lived and worshipped God in an acceptable way, you can come back and be restored to Him so that you can once again... Enjoy the blessings that God will give unto His children and those who worship Him acceptably. Anyone who worships God in, an, in a way that is not acceptable cannot please God. But we, ha because God has instructed us how to worship Him, and those avenues through which we worship Him, we can worship Him acceptably. If you've not been doing that, we would encourage you to come back and be faithful to Him. And if you need to come and need the prayers of the, of the saints, then why not come as we stand and sing this invitation song?